Now on Meet, Meet the, the Drapers. Drapers! No other show in the world that allows you to invest. Into startups. So many problems there, never used it in my life. And we have a team that's ready to build. Definitely in the bag. I haven't got that one yet. My sister Polly. A billion dollars. How yeah. do you do that? I loved her reason for getting into it. Unprecedented. Nobody's ever done it. And that didn't happen in Wall Street. Welcome, I'm Tim Draper. I'm in the venture capital business with Draper Associates, and this is my father, Bill Draper. He, he runs Draper Richards Kaplan Foundation for nonprofit organizations. As venture capitalists, sense of accomplishment helps nonprofit organizations get started. Everything we can do to help others in need is so important. He's been a venture capitalist for many, many years, and this is my sister, Polly. She is a producer, actor, director of movies and TV. Oh no, oh no, that is so impossible. I just asked whether you're the type of woman that men wanted to marry. So what did you say? <laughs> so we're gonna have three very different perspectives as we interview these entrepreneurs. So this is what we do on Meet the Drapers. We interview entrepreneurs, they give their pitches, there may be three per episode. We make it so that you can invest from your couch into some of these interesting startups. But then how do you buy into these tokens? Well, we've figured it out. And so through Meet the Drapers, you will go on to the Republic site, you'll lend some money into the company, the company will then buy you some tokens and within some period of time, they will get you your tokens. It should be one to three years once those tokens are issued and you will be a token holder. This is a unprecedented, nobody's ever done it. So what I thought we'd do first is just sort of say, what do you think, Dad, makes a great entrepreneur? An entrepreneur needs to be, a good entrepreneur needs to have a lot of energy, a lot of drive, willingness to break through brick walls. A good entrepreneur should be able to build a team. And Polly. You're an entrepreneur. You created the Naked Brothers Band, the show on Nickelodeon, and you created a movie called The Tick Code, and you created one recently called Stella's Last Weekend. Yep, that's coming out in October. Coming out in October. Everybody watch Stella's yes. Last Weekend in October. Yes. I'll add my piece to this. Yes. I oh, don't bother. <laughs> <laughs> when I look for an entrepreneur, I'm kind of looking for someone, yes, like Polly. Someone who is passionate about what they're doing. Related to you? Related to me. <laughs> the other thing I look for is somebody who, who is going after an industry where they are kind of angry because the industry provides bad service at, at a high cost and they're taking on some new technology and they're applying that in a new way to the industry. And that's sort of how we make our original assessment and then when we when we finally meet the entrepreneurs it's the ones that blow you over it they change your whole way of thinking they throw real passion at you real excitement they're energetic and it's a maniacal dedication to their mission so enough about what we think let's get introduced to some of the entrepreneurs and before we do that let's see what the entrepreneurs are doing backstage When I answered, I saw this Tesla. Tesla, who has Tesla in the office? You know? What I'm most concerned about my presentation is focusing on telling a good story with passion, but keeping it bottled in a little bit. Hey, I'm Harold. I'm the founder and CEO of Bandwagon. We're building this company so that fans everywhere, whether it's sports or concerts, no matter where they bought their tickets, can be real and authentic. I know what it's like to spend $100 and not be able to get into the game. We want to preserve that fan experience. Uniquely, sports brings everyone together. And so that's something that's really inspired me to kind of connect in that similar way with friends and family as we continue to build this. And so building this company from Greenville, South Carolina, and really just looking at my journey here from being the son of an immigrant, Jamaican American family, I want the Drapers to see an entrepreneur who's willing to run through a wall and do everything they can to overcome obstacles to get to this point. 
Welcome to Meet the Drapers. Give us your pick. Thank y'all for having me. I'm Harold Hughes, and I'm the founder and CEO of Bandwagon. But before that, I'm a sports fan. And like most sports fans this year, I was watching the NBA Finals, watching the Golden State Warriors take home their third title in four years. But most Golden State fans really wish they could have been in the arena with their team to see them win that title. With average ticket prices of over $1,700 to get in, fans who were hopeful were going to have to try and find a deal. And that's where the problem began. Dozens and hundreds of fans were denied at the gate for this year's NBA Finals because, unbeknownst to them, their tickets were fake. And this isn't just a U.S. thing. Just in May of this year, Barcelona announced a $1.8 million ticket scam. This is happening in headlines from ticketed live events like concerts all the way down to sports. And so what we've been able to do is harness the power of the blockchain to utilize the very core technology to make the experience better for fans. So it's safer because we're using cryptographic security. Our implementation is super simple, so teams don't have to go through the headache of pitching this and making it tough on their team. And last, we're making it secure. We view the future of this as SaaS, stadium as a service, giving the fans the ultimate experience, and that's why we're using technology like blockchain to make that happen. So I'd like to invite you all to jump on the bandwagon with us. Terrific. A couple of things. One is, what if StubHub just decided to put the blockchain on all those tickets or Ticketmaster or whoever? <laughs> Definitely. When we think about ticketing, it's a really siloed industry. If you think about the StubHubs and Ticketmasters of the world, these are true competitors. And so the idea of one of those major companies creating their own blockchain and getting their competitors to participate is a lot ch more challenging. Oh, than I see. Things. So you can be Geneva. You can exactly. be the safe spot. Yep. Everybody gets to use Absolutely. It. Blockchain on its basis is a ledger. What we're using is a ledger that ties multiple ticket companies together so that they all are able to show that customer who's buying that this is a real ticket every single time. So there's no token here. No tokens. Yeah. Technology used in Bitcoin right. was the blockchain. And the blockchain keeps a perfect ledger Record of every of every... single debit and credit that goes through. Right. It also can take care of all data. Any kind of data, it can verify that data. This is about making sure all those tickets are real and fair. Correct. So in that... Then why do you have more fan engagement and food and beverage sales and all that stuff? What, how do you make money that way? Right. So the core of what we do is focus on identity. We want teams to know who's in the stadium on the day of the event also concert artists and so on. So there's no real way for you to say a follow-up for if I buy a ticket on the secondary market and the team doesn't know I'm there, I don't get the follow-up, thanks for coming, here's half off of the next game. I don't get the opportunity to say 10% on merchandise because the team won. There's a huge disconnect between teams and the fans who are actually sitting there on the day of the event. But we also know there's scalpers and there's brokers and people who are making a lot of money taking advantage of people. With our technology, we're actually using the ledger to prove that tickets are real, to make sure that the person who's reselling them on the second sites is the actual owner and then third there's no restrictions in the ability to transfer that allows teams to be able to increase fan engagement that allows them to monetize extra food and beverage because in that case I'd say I want to target the people sitting in section 113 for these last 100 hot dogs I have with you know four minutes left in the fourth quarter now I can message them directly today that can't really happen because fans are showing up to the arena from dozens of different places you can also reach all those people outside of the arena Absolutely. Right? so after they've been Before, you have their that. identity Yep. You have their name and you can say, hey, there's another game coming up. Absolutely. You want to go Is buy through? Some... Yes. That that, that's exactly how we do it. So we want to focus on creating that manifest. And so we're using a permissioned blockchain. It's not like cryptocurrencies or Bitcoin or Ethereum. It's a permissioned blockchain, which allows us to say, this ticket company's part of the ecosystem, this ticket company's part of the ecosystem, and they're all able to verify that this is actually a real transaction and this person owns it. I mean, you need to get StubHub and Ticketmaster yep. and all of them to say, yeah. Yep. We're we're gonna go. Absolutely. How do you get them to yeah, do it without turning the screws on you regularly? Yeah, the number one thing we're finding is that there's a $2.3 billion fraud problem in the uh, US from ticketing. Most of that is eaten by StubHub and Ticketmaster because they're so large. And so for us, we're saying, in exchange for making this problem go away from you, we wanna help encourage more fans to come to the game. That's what the big value is. And how do you charge? We charge a toll for every time a ticket moves through the ecosystem. So think 10 or 20 cents every time a ticket it moves to the ecosystem, but we also sign a one-time licensing fee to the team.
team, let's say we start with our first customer, Sacramento State. Sacramento State would pay us somewhere between ten and $100,000 based on the size of their stadium. And then when they have multiple ticket companies, let's say Ticketmaster, StubHub, or whoever, anytime a ticket's resold and moved through that ecosystem, we take 10 cents from those ticket companies. But how you don't get any money from food and beverage. Not yet, but we do think that we'll be able to build that out down the road. How far along are you what, in dollars and cents right now? Yeah, so we have two customers and we have over $100,000 in revenue in the last 18 months. Our blockchain is fully up and running. We have 558,000 tickets on our blockchain, so we're able to validate those as they move through the ecosystem. And we have a team that's ready to build. But that's not very much related mm -hmm. to all you're doing. Sure. What's next year? What are you projecting? We project that next year we'll be closer to 1.2 million. Uh, with the licenses that we're getting, in the beginning was really investing deeply into the tech. What are your costs uh, out of a million two revenue mm -hmm. next year? What do you expect? Um, our cost should be just north of $400,000. So it's really high margin. Yeah, huge huge high margin business because we're putting the investment to the software to make it super simple for folks. That Who else money. is on your team? Uh, we have a CTO who's based in the Bay Area. Uh, I'm the CEO and went to Clemson University. I studied economics and political science. And our COO is a rock star from the sales and technology space. We, we both grew up in the distribution space. So asset management and barcoding and RFID. We're approaching ticketing from an asset standpoint. We want to be able to track it from its inception to delivery and consumption. We've added some awesome advisors like Orlando Jones, entertainer and tech investor, and most recently, Melly Price, who exited a company called Frontgate to Live Nation. So now we're building those, those pillars into our team and now we're looking for that next step. I once got a fake ticket. What was great about it was they saw that it was a fake ticket and they saw that I had paid for the fake ticket a right. lot of money right. and they said, well, it's okay. There they kind of let it happen. Good. It would have been better to know for sure yeah. if that was a real ticket. Yeah, we think validity is super important when it comes to this stuff. And so we want to prevent that. We want more families and more friends to have better experiences at live events. And having those tickets be authentic is one piece. But being able to do great touch points, with fan engagement, and marketing before, during, and after the event, we think changes everything. Well, thank you very much for coming in to I meet the Drapers. It. Thank you very much. All right. well, have a good one. It's so awesome to be here with the Drapers, a legendary Silicon Valley family, to see how they started and being able to create generational impact, that's what I wanna be able to do for my family. I love the fact that we're giving opportunity for viewers to get in on crowd equity because this is gonna give them an opportunity to change their generation. And I'm loving that we're gonna be one of those platforms that they can consider. So we'll see what our judges thought of Bandwagon. Polly, what did you think of Bandwagon? I like the idea of using the blockchain part. If this does expand into the concert arena, I know that when Nat and Alex, who were my sons, who were rock stars, there was one concert in New Orleans where they had sold fake tickets and there were a lot of little girls crying. It's heart-wrenching if it's something that you really cared about. But he wants the fact the that he knows people how to reach them later is I think a really it's big the deal. Most yeah. important part of it. Yeah, that he ends up with everybody's, everybody's identity. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that or brings whoever. me yeah. to the one thing that bothers me too, and that's the fear of grabbing people's identity. But I know that they'd be willing. There's just something about that that. Yeah, I, no, I. Yeah, but if you're a, a if you're a Nat, Nat, uh, Alex fan, you and your kids are probably not going to tell you when their next concert yeah, is. Yeah, yeah. The benefit yeah. of giving a company your data is that you get better information yeah. yourself. And I don't know uh, how he's going to get all of those people signed up, okay. StubHub and Ticketmaster, and because, but a couple of big ones. The, but they're the big ones are the hardest to get. That's right, and that's they're going to say. So well, he'll what's have to start. Small and, and build gonna... up. I should have asked him about that. Well, uh, what's in it for them is they're going to save a billion dollars worth of fraud and tickets because they're the ones that have to eat the cost. If there's really that much fraud, I... Well, let's go to our oracle. Yeah. Let's see what the crystal ball, what what vibes the crystal ball sends us about bandwagon. Mm. Are we going to get on the bandwagon? <laughs> <laughs> or are we going to be off the bandwagon? Okay, oh, everybody got it? <laughs> <laughs> you can do this at home, too. Thumbs up, thumbs down, thumbs all around. Ready? Thumbs up, thumbs, thumbs down, down, thumbs all around. Interesting. We had sort of a very interesting mix this time. Yeah. We did My thumb is sort of three quarters. 
Can you do that? I just did. <laughs> so it's up to you, audience. You like that guy and you want to go back him, you can do it. You can go to meetthedrapers.com and you can invest. My name is Anastasia Green, and I'm founder and CEO of Oracoins. We are disrupting the hiring market using one of the most innovative technologies in the world, like blockchain and artificial intelligence. I'm coming from Ukraine, and I'm seeing this huge inequality of salaries. An engineer in Silicon Valley can get price of 200 an hour, in Ukraine will get 20 an hour. I think the difference of 15 times is not really okay. People should be valued and they should be priced and rated by their talent, by their actual technical skills. Drapers are visionary family and it's such an honor to pitch to them personally, especially team being one of the first evangelists of bitcoins or cryptocurrency, one of the first believers. The show gives opportunity to bring the problem you're solving to so many people around the world and now they will have a chance not just to hear about it but also to participate and solve it together welcome to meet the drapers hey give us your pitch hi guys thank you my name is anastasia green i'm ceo and founder of aura coins we're disrupting upwork and top tell with the power of blockchain i'm sure you know that the hiring industry is broken there are so many problems there one of them is it's really hard to find the right, especially tech talent. In the US it costs about $38,000 and take you about three to six months to hire the right engineer. 36% of the companies are trying to hire overseas, hire remotely because it's more opportunities there, but it's still really hard to assess skills and trust person overseas. And then when you're trying to pay them, it's credit card scams, high transaction fees, like 20% fees was up work, and then some of the talent in emerging markets simply can't accept dollars. So we're building Aura Coins to disrupt this market and to fix these problems. Right now, we've been building this company for one year. We established deep partnerships with Chinese company Talentbot that has one million engineers in China that are gonna be represented on our platform. We have partners in Silicon Valley with engineers. We have partners in Eastern Europe with one of the smartest brains in the world. And we got funded. We got angel round of 50K in this February. Right now, we're closing the deal for 300K and we're fundraising our next uh, round through the token sale. Great, so who's the smartest brain in in Ukraine. Eastern Europe? Yes, that's a great <laughs> question. That's our CTO. His name is Dmitry. He's in Ukraine now managing the team. He's been in tech from the time he was born, I think. So you you're due for your aura. I'm a product-oriented CEO, so I'm responsible for product, and I'm responsible for business development, fundraising, and I guess inspiration. <laughs> Why do we need the blockchain for this, and what, what's the benefit? Now, you mentioned smart contracts. Is that so that anybody who helped out in the hiring of somebody gets some Bitcoin or something? Yes, exactly. So basically, our idea is to make this platform decentralized, and it's one of the hardest parts of hiring. It's actually understand what this person knows. So we're using the power of the platform of other engineers who can evaluate skills of this specific engineer on some, some level and give them yes or no, like you guys do here. Everybody who participated in the contract, either it was the hiring person or it was the code review person, can get their percentage from this transaction. Just by voting on the person, you're getting some tokens. How are you going to spread the network of token holders? What's my incentive to go be a token holder? First of all... Not at the ICO, I get that, they're yeah, as speculating. A user, right? As a user, why am I doing it? We have three main users. First of all, it's the companies who want to hire. The incentive for them is very simple. It's easier, you can pay in these tokens. For the engineers, it doesn't matter what currency the company will be paying them in, they can receive our token and then convert it into any other currency they want to. Their price rate is dependent on their score. The more they use the platform, the more they use the contract, the more they receive reviews, the higher they can price themselves on a global workplace. Mm. And again, it won't matter if you are from Africa or from India or from Latin America. You can still earn as much as somebody from Silicon Valley or Canada if you are talented. Talented or active. You're talking about active, not talented, right? Yeah. You're no, talking about they're people getting, who are active the doing this. Well, they're getting reviews from other people, right? Yeah, well, first of all... They're giving reviews. Okay. The main, the most active user is somebody who's working on the platform. It's engineer itself. Good. And why are you doing it? Why do you care? You know, my 
parents are uh, engineers and they're working for government company in Ukraine building rocket ships. They have more than 20 years experience. I don't think you can guess their salary. It's $300 a month. $300. What? $300? $300 a month. Oh my God. You know how much engineer, junior engineer in Silicon Valley, you know, SpaceX or NASA can make? So it's 15 to 20 times difference. And I don't Why think... don't they go apply to a job at SpaceX? It's a different mentality. It's a post-Soviet Union country. They are not that... I don't think they will be able to sell themselves. How did you become the way you became then? I was, you know, in post-Soviet Union countries, people think that selling is very bad, kind yeah. of like bad thing to do. Yeah, yeah. But I loved it. You know, it's like, if I learn how to sell, I will be good in life forever. I was studying uh, management, international economics, never used it in my life, honestly. All my experience came from, from working for companies, for solving real problems, for starting my own companies, for failing my own companies, etc., etc. It's been more valuable than education for me. Well, thank you very much. Thank and you. thanks thank for coming and pitching Aura. Thank you. Terrific. Good luck to you. Very, you very nice much. to see you. Thank you. I was expecting them to be more VC style, scary and stressful, like they will push me to the edge, asking numbers, revenue projections, that kind of thing. But it was the opposite of that. They were like, tell us about your parents. Tell us about where you came from. Oh, you're from Ukraine. This is so exciting. Every time when you pitch it to the VC, most of the times you hear no. But we're not just building tech company. They got what we are after. We are bringing equality and transparency into the hiring process. So let's see what the judges think of Aura. Polly, what did you think? Loved her passion. I loved her reason for getting into it. I loved her pants. Yeah. She's You've got a new pants. tattoo there. I'm yeah. wondering why that happened. I read a book called The Startup Hero <laughs> by Tim Draper. It was a total setup. <laughs> and Tim said, make a bucket list, go for your dreams. I'd always had on my bucket list the dream of getting a tattoo. And I got a tattoo. Ta-da! Oh, it's lovely. Okay, and Dad, what did you think of Aura? <laughs> I think it's, uh, it's a go, it's a win. So I thought it was pretty interesting because what I look for when people are doing an ICO or a, a new cryptocurrency is I'm looking for something that can create a network so that it spreads because the, the more the network spreads, the more valuable the, the token becomes. And she did have that. She had engineer to engineer, which is, by the way, not a really fast moving network, but engineer to engineer, would the, the network would spread and it would become more valuable. And there was a real reason for people to buy the tokens. A lot of these ICOs are just like, hey, buy my token, and then they're out there, yeah. and there's we a coin, the and there's no reason. value. A token is a new kind of currency. Right. It's a new way of operating. Some of the tokens are tied to an asset, and that's more of a security, but most tokens are these currencies. And Bitcoin was the first of these currencies, and then Ethereum, and then others. After Ethereum, just to explain to the audience, Tim got started with Bitcoin at the very beginning. Well, not the very beginning, but pretty close to yeah. the beginning. The new cryptocurrencies launch, and the way they launch is they create an ICO, initial coin offering, and they say, here, we have a coin. You guys, go ahead, do something with it, spread it. A coin, if I just have all the coins, you don't want the coins, you don't care about the coins, but if, if we all have coins and we all recognize them as tender, as something that we can trade, then those the things are value. really valuable. They be, the more of us, all of you, and if all of us recognize a currency, suddenly that like currency a dollar is bill. worth a lot. Sounds and the sorry. reason, you know, you, you said dollar bill. Sure, it's still quite a valuable currency, but it's still subject to the whims of some government or another. In the case of the dollar bill, it's the U.S. government, very secure government. But if you're talking about the Argentinian peso, you know that thing is dropping 30% a yeah. year forever. So you'd much rather have a cryptocurrency operating in your country yeah. than the currency that's tied to some I see. government or another. So, bottom line. Bottom line, we've got to we got to consult the crystal ball. All right. Okay. Now. So, 
Crystal ball, crystal ball. <laughs> Send us the message on aura, aura. Feel your aura. <laughs> okay, now we're gonna vote. Okay, you ready? Up, down, all around, boom. Whoa, oh, three, three thumbs up for the Ukrainian up. aura. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Let's see who the next great entrepreneur is who's gonna come pitch. Meet the Drapers. Oh. Hey. <laughs> I'm Chelsea, the founder and CEO of Shipsy. We are giving consumers the ability to order now and get it now. We are delivering merchandise to consumers directly into any existing e-commerce market. We put a button at checkout so that consumers can have their stuff within an hour or less. I knew retail and I knew the technology and I knew the opportunity behind it. I wanted to make every shopper's dream come true and give retailers the ability to meet today's consumer demand. It's such an honor to actually be here. I feel like everyone knows the Drapers and now I get to meet them in real life. It's like we're taking our relationship to a whole new level. Welcome to Meet the Drapers. <laughs> Hi. Thank you, I'm Give so excited. Hey, we're excited to uh, have you. Oh, good. I'm Chelsea Lee, I'm the founder and CEO of Shipsy. Before we dive into it today, has anyone ordered anything online recently? A couple things? Yeah. Have you ever ordered anything? I keep anything? having to order new slippers because my dog, we have a new <laughs> puppy, oh. and the slippers are the puppy's toy thing, yes. play things. I should just get him slippers. And yes, yeah. Order them but anyway, on. I ordered a bunch of slippers. All right, well yeah. this is probably one of the best examples I've ever had. Let's say new dog's name is? Is Toshi. Toshi. Named after Satoshi Nakamoto, the Very cool. of Bitcoin. Ah, there we go. <laughs> So Toshi is chewing up all your slippers. Yes. You want to order a new pair right now before bed, or you have some guests coming over, you want to be cozy. What if you were shopping, buying your slippers online? Let's say at checkout you had an option to get it in seven to 10 days for free, overnight for 40, or you could get it within an hour for, let's say six bucks. Which one are you going to choose? Nice. Mm -hmm. Short oh. term. Shorter. I want it now. Yeah. Now, now and <laughs> cheap. And cheap. We want yes. them cheap. That's yeah. exactly what we're doing. We are putting a button at checkout in any existing brand or retailer's website. The consumers can receive merchandise within an hour or less. How do you do that? Magic. <laughs> <laughs> it really is, but there's a lot behind the scenes that goes on. To preface it, we don't own any cars, warehouses, merchandise. We first integrate directly into any existing e-commerce platform to add the button. Then we plug into the last mile delivery network. We basically aggregate the Ubers, the Postmates, the Instacarts, the delivers, and then we also tie into the item management system for the brand to ensure that merchandise is there. So these have to be big brands. Not necessarily. Well, they've got to have a warehouse within yeah. six hours of my house. Good question. We pick up from a store location, a warehouse, or a distribution center, any three. So they've got to have one nearby. Yes. So it has to be pretty big. Could be pretty big, but we also have business rules set on the back end that we work with brands and retailers to define so that consumers don't see the option if they don't meet that business criteria. For example, a specific geographic radius of the store or a specific merchandise or specific pickup times for the warehouse. The brand or the retailer can change things like, I want it to be a five mile radius of my store or a 10 mile radius. They can make those kind of changes. So how do you make money? Each brand and retailer pays a one-time setup fee, a monthly recurring fee, and then also a flat rate transaction fee. Top what is that? The monthly. A percentage of the retail cost yes. of the item are you charging? So we don't do it by item or by order. We do it 100% volume or value based for the retailer. That monthly fee ranges from $100 to $10,000, depending on how much volume they have, and we break them up into four different tiers. You're just taking a little piece on the top, and that's, yeah. The solution that we have right now, so we have different partners that we look at the inventory, so Shopify, for example, and we're working with Oracle and Magento and Demandware as well to make it completely automated, so we really don't have to touch it a lot. Why do you care? Yeah, I can get all this stuff on Amazon. Yeah, I, can... I had been working countless, with countless brands and retailers. I come from corporate retail, and every brand, no matter who it was, between Bob's Bait Shop and Nike and everything in between, was trying to figure out how to meet today's consumer demands and how to stay alive against Amazon. So I thought that there had to be a way for them to be able to do that. 
There is also actually a, a play to partner with Amazon for us in that their fulfillment by Amazon sellers send merchandise to the warehouse and then they're prime eligible, but they have all of these marketplace sellers that send directly from their store or garage. They don't have a way to be prime eligible, so we would basically fill that gap for them as well. What is your background? How did you get into this? Yeah, I started in corporate retail, working at a retailer in London, and then worked at Saks Fifth Avenue in New York. Doing what? Uh, working in the buying office. And then I started working in uh, Minneapolis, where I'm originally from, at a technology company called SBS Commerce. And then had the luxury of working with three amazing mentors there. And, and then who else is now on your team? Yeah, so I met my co-founder, Ben. Uh, we were good friends and I called him because I woke up one day and I felt like all my counterparts were 50 year old men and couldn't really, I didn't know, I wasn't learning as much every day. Wait, you can't firm. learn from 50, 50 year old men. men. I can, I can, <laughs> but... That was really bad. That was a, no, he, you prefer 90 year old men. 90 year old men, yes. I just wasn't learning as much every day. So he asked me to look at it as a favor and I looked at it and I dove into the technology and said, why are we doing this for traditional logistics, why not on-demand and e-commerce? It's the same API that we can use. So that's how we got here today. So Ben, my co-founder, is a serial entrepreneur, angel investor, has built 30-plus technology platforms. Aren't there um, competitors just you, well, doing this? Okay. Just you and Ben? We have six total team members, so three are full-time, three are part-time. The rest of the team is collectively people that I've got to work with from sort of different areas of my life. Work Why are they all 50-year-old men? I was men? just going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, pretty, pretty close. <laughs> I just wanted the 90-year-old instead. <laughs> so How about competition? Good. You're white labeling, mm -hmm. so you're not getting your brand out there into the hands of all those consumers? In an indirect way. So I see us having 20 to 30 strategic partners like the Shopify's who then go roll it out to their retail customers, who then go roll it out to the consumers. But I love that we give the retail the credit at the end of the day. You love it, except... Don't you want the end user to know who Shipsy is? It depends. We've we've toyed around with a few things. Right now we have some black boxes that things are delivered in. Really it's about getting more sales for the brands and the retailers. And if we get credit for it, okay. If we don't, okay. Well, thank you very yeah. much for coming in thank to meet you the for Drapers. Me. Good job. Thank you. Really very nice job. And I like the idea. I will pay the extra six dollars to get my slippers right away. All right, thanks. So nice Good to meet to you. you. Yeah, Great. thank you. I went into it knowing that they would be incredible and they were even better than I could have ever hoped for or anticipated. I was really surprised by Tim's response when I asked him what the last thing that he wanted online was. Slippers? I haven't got that one yet. I wish that I would have changed the way that I said the pricing a little bit. Bill had asked me to clarify and I realized that I just completely skipped over what the monthly fee is. And, and I really liked that I actually got feedback. Tim said, I think that you need to have your brand out there. It's something that no one has really had the courage to tell me. It's definitely in the bag. I thought that Bill was gonna get his checkbook out. I even brought a pen. You often have a guest judge. <laughs> this time the guest judge is, is our crystal, crystal. ball. We'll just see what the crystal ball thinks after we've made our, our determination. All right. Okay, so Polly, what did you think? I thought she was really smart. I love someone who's disrupting Amazon. I'm not sure that she is really going to be able to manage growth, but Ben, who we didn't meet, may be a very important element and bring some of the things that I thought were lacking in her uh, ability to really run a company. Actually, I think uh, <laughs> she is really good front person for a consumer products company. The problem is this is a logistics company, and I don't think that she's... That's, that's my, I love. Mm. Boy, she's really bright and really passionate, really good, excited about what she's doing for now. I feel like she has the interest in maybe being an e-commerce site herself or, or something a little bit more along those lines. That was my, my feeling. Everybody's being crushed by Amazon, so all of these e-commerce sites, I think, are going to want quick delivery. Okay, crystal ball. Everybody's hands have to be up against the crystal ball. Oh, we touch it? No. 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 
<laughs> crystal ball, crystal ball. What do you think of Shipsy? <laughs> of all. I know everybody's gotten a message from their crystal ball. Now let's vote. Okay. Up, down, down all, all around. around. So and there you have it. But you, the viewership, you can make your own determination. You can decide. You can fund her. Fund Shipsy. Go to meetthedrapers.com and you'll have an opportunity to go ahead, put $100, $200 right behind her and make her a success and get your slippers in less than six hours. <laughs> <laughs> You all know that I love crypto. I'm wearing my Bitcoin tie. I'm totally into all this. It's gonna change the way everybody operates. And so we have a special extra piece to this program. And I'm gonna interview a series of people, one per show, about the blockchain, Bitcoin, Ethereum, whatever. And you guys get the benefit of that. I'm here with my son, Adam. This is his first appearance on Meet the Drapers. Good to have you on the show. Adam and I are both uh, sort of obsessed with the idea of Bitcoin, the blockchain, cryptocurrencies, and how they're transforming the world. Tell me how you got into this. Six years ago, it was one guy in a coffee shop pitching me about changing the world. What he said was, at some point, the world is gonna be on one financial infrastructure. Forgetting about all the borders, forgetting about all the different governance that humans have put into place, and making transactions frictionless. Now, you can list an idea on the blockchain, and you can raise money from anyone all over the world. It's not in one area, it's all over the world. And so last year, that went crazy. Everyone was coming up with ideas and fundraising and raising hundreds of millions of dollars, and that was really, really exciting. So when there's a new technology like this, it changes all sorts of things. So the bankers are going to be upset. Bitcoin some, somehow is a better currency than what they've got. Yeah. And they're going, whoa, hey, we don't want this. And then they fight it, and then the regulators come in, and the, the press says, wait, I kind of like my bank account. Then the press realizes that, oh, actually, this is a better way to move currency. Yeah. What do you think of that? How have the regulators affected this, and how do you think they should do things moving forward? This is obviously a disruptive thing to the governments that be, because suddenly they don't control your money anymore, and all of the citizens, all of these people all over the world are saying, what is money? It's the first time in at least my life where I feel a whole generation of people is asking what money really is and how can it be better. It's not just pieces of paper. This is a technology that is impacting not one country. All different countries have different Federal Reserve related systems and different governments that are regulating them. Suddenly I control my own money and I can cross borders frictionlessly with no other centralized authority being able to actually confiscate that money or stop me from withdrawing money. So teach all of our viewers something that we don't all know. Whatever just came to your mind. <laughs> <laughs> we are in a transition phase from being a very physical world to being a very digital world. And up to this point, we've only been able to look at that world through a window, which is our computer, our phone. We've never been able to immerse ourselves until now with virtual reality. Cryptocurrency and virtual reality are going to create the largest economy that has ever existed together. They are the perfect use case for each other. Awesome. Okay. Well, thank you, son. <laughs> thank you, father. <laughs> Great to we, have we'll do it again another sometime. Draper yeah. on Meet the Drapers. Thank you. Great to have you. Okay, so that wraps up the first episode of Meet the Drapers. We saw three really interesting entrepreneurs, and yep. maybe it spurred on some thought. Venture capital is mm. fun because you meet with all these entrepreneurs. Yeah. Some of them, you know, you, you say, well, thanks, but no thanks. <laughs> but they are so fun. I think that 
We, uh, in the venture capital business, had the best business of all because we talked with so many entrepreneurs, got acquainted with them, and brought some of those ideas back home. Now, I don't know what you thought as one of the kids back home, but did you become an entrepreneur because I mean, because you were an entrepreneur, and from the be from when you were selling oysters well, off the you, trunk, out of the trunk of the I car. Think you, <laughs> Tim, Tim, that's right. He Tim brought oysters from Inverness down to Atherton, a two-hour trip in the car in some faulty freezing. It was hot weather. It was the, car, the, car, <laughs> the car never smelled the he same did, after. He did. I don't think there were any deaths reported from bad No, oysters, but we but blew, one of them blew up in this woman's <laughs> microwave, which was when I, I did door-to-door -door sales. And I door said, oh, she said, do they work in a microwave? Up. And I said, oh, yeah, let's try it. <laughs> <laughs> and there was the oyster. We're watching it. Boom! <laughs> <laughs> so then the next person. But I think maybe I became more entrepreneurial because you, you had such respect for those entrepreneurs. Yeah. I and do. so I kind of yeah, looked I at it and knew. I thought, well, gee, you know, I can go do that. And she probably did too. I remember you came back with these oysters and then you had to sell them. <laughs> and so, of course, our family, our family friends were the ones that you would think are Victims. the easiest sale. Victims. So you get on the phone and I watch you hour after hour and you dialed the phone in those days. Yeah. It was. Dial, <laughs> dialing these numbers. Hi, Mrs. Redfield, I've got some oysters here. <laughs> would you like to buy a dozen? And hour after hour you were on the phone and I knew you'd be successful. It takes persistence and dedication to the job of finishing the sale. That is why I'm so in love with all these entrepreneurs that we're meeting. And now we're gonna have more entrepreneurs this season, a lot of interesting blockchain, a lot of interesting uh, new kinds of e-commerce companies. All sorts of things are gonna happen in this wild and wonderful season two. And we'll see you next time on Meet, Meet the, the Drapers! Drapers. When Satoshi Nakamoto The biggest blockchain event that has ever happened on the West Coast. Welcome to Token Fest. Blockchain will impact every major industry in the world. Hi, my name is Nathan Nichols, the CEO of Tax Token. And my name is Graham Goddard. I'm with All Public Art, monetizing art in a way that's never been seen before. It has the potential to completely revolutionize the way we look at any marketplace. It will be used in two days to verify the Russian president election. We're using blockchain to give absolute trust and confidence. We're using blockchain. We're a blockchain-based company. Blockchain. Blockchain. Blockchain is the future. Thank you for coming. This is the beginning.